Uh, well, thank you, Steve, and thank you to everyone who's, uh, who's come out on this beautiful evening to speak about this very important topic. Uh, first, I should say it's only appropriate that I'd be speaking just after Reed. Uh, my firm, Fossil Free Indexes, is best known for publishing the Carbon Underground 200, the 200 list that Senator Kruger has referred to. And in fact, that was started by Carbon Tracker as the Carbon Tracker 200 list about four years ago. A carbon Tracker has gone on to do some outstanding analytical work and has not pursued maintaining that list. Uh, at Fossil Free Index, we, we picked up that baton with the support of 350.org and Carbon Tracker as well. Uh, what I wanted to do tonight was to speak about the nature of the 200 list and how it's being used by investors and activists as a roadmap to help abate and hopefully prevent future climate change. So first, when we, when we, look, at, um, when we look at the Carbon Underground 200, and when we calculate that, there are two basic steps. When we speak of carbon reserves for public companies, there are a wide range of carbon reserves. Some of them are not uh, quite as dirty as others. Some are not as serious, whether it's uh, high-grade oil, whether it's gas, or even in the case of coal, it could be anthracite, which is uh, reasonably um, uh, efficient as a fuel. On the other hand, the fuels go down as far as uh, lignite coal, which is sort of like burning your mattress to keep the bedroom warm, warm at night. It's a particularly dirty fuel. So we begin by surveying over a thousand companies, public and private worldwide, to calculate the raw reserves that they have, whether it's oil and gas or whether it's coal. The key step from a global warming point of view is when we transform these raw reserves based on the quality of the fuel to calculate the carbon emissions potential embedded in those fuels. Again, comparing anthracite with, uh, with lignite coal as an example. Um, when we look at, uh, when we look at the top 200 firms that in the carbon underground 200, the total that we calculate for carbon emissions embedded in those reserves are 550 gigatons. Which is, now, if we compare that to what Steve mentioned in terms of annual use, they mentioned 49 million billion giga or 45, 49 gigatons a year. Uh, so, it seems like, in fact, there isn't a whole lot in the ground. We compare that to what Reed mentioned in terms of a carbon budget of 900 gigatons that the IPCC suggests that is possible to burn before we bridge this two degree centigrade barrier. Again, the 550 gigaton barrier total doesn't seem that extreme. But what we are measuring are just the top 200 public companies. In that total, we're not including private companies and we're not including government entities. When we total up all of the reserves that carbon emissions embedded in reserves worldwide, we're looking at something over 3,000 gigatons. We compare that to the 900 gigaton figure that Reed mentioned. What we have in the ground, again, is more than three times what, what we can burn. When we look at the top 200 companies with 550 gigatons, the need to, to keep those reserves in the ground is even greater than the top 30%, given the, na the nature of those reserves. How is this data being used? And here, I want to thank uh, Council Person Rosenthal, Co Senator Kruger for their comments, and I think Helen focused on this concept of a roadmap for measuring risk. And there are two essential uses of our information. First, 
irrespective of what an individual's view is, what an organization's view is, it's essential as a responsible investor, as a responsible custodian of funds, to at least know what the carbon exposure of that fund is. So the first use of the carbon in the ground 200 is to measure that exposure, and Senator Kruger has told us that New York State has already taken this first important step, indicating that there are roughly, roughly 5.2 billion uh, in, in assets invested in, the, in carbon underground 200 companies. Uh, the second step can be what to do from an investment point of view. And from an investment point of view, there's the engagement alternative that Reed has described. There's the, uh, there's the divestment perspective or investment approach that Sir Kruger has, uh, has described. Thank you. Um, when we developed the Carbon Underground 200, when we took over this role from Reed, we didn't just do it for the current period, which was 2014, was our first report. We built a history going back 10 years, now 11 years. And from that history, we developed an index, which is essentially a fossil-free S&P 500. That's to say, every year, we looked at the S&P 500, we looked at the number of companies in the S&P 500 which were on our, current, on our carbon underground list. Currently, that's 26 companies. So we now have an index which is effectively a fossil, a fossil-free S&P 500 or a fossil-free 474 index. And we did this going back over 10 years and we measured the results of investing in that index versus investing in the entire S&P 500. And in fact, the results were statistically indistinguishable for those two indexes, that both in terms of return and in terms of risk, they were statistically indistinguishable over the entire 10 years. And for three sub-periods that we measured, the, uh, the period before the economic calamity of 2008, 2009, during the economic meltdown and subsequent to the meltdown in the recovery. And for each of those three periods, we found that the results were virtually the same. So when you hear politicians speak, when you hear people speak in endowment circles, consultants in particular, about the risk of divesting from fossil fuels, there's a strong case to be made that at worst, performance should be very similar. In fact, over the past year, since the meltdown in energy prices, uh, there has been something of a disconnect. The index has outperformed the S&P 500. The fossil free index has outperformed the S&P 500 by 2%. So there has been a bit of, of disconnect. There's another point. There's, there's a important issue in regard to divestment or any area of carbon responsible investing, whether it's engagement or other approaches. That's to say an investor can reasonably say, or a fiduciary can reasonably say, carbon prices, the WTI, West Texas Intermediate Barrel of Oil, as, as an example, has fallen from $170, $107 a barrel just over a year ago to $44 a barrel today, aren't we locking the door after the cows have already walked away? Isn't it really too late from an investment point of view to divest? And the answer to that has to do with what Reed has mentioned, the work of Carbon Tracker, the work of other, the IPCC and other, and other organizations, which is that the public companies and other entities have to keep at least two-thirds or more of their carbon reserves in the ground before their serious, serious, even more serious, climate change consequences. And for public companies today, whether they have to keep, whether ultimately they're forced to keep two-thirds of their reserves in the ground or half or a quarter of those reserves in the ground, at the, when the point comes that through regulation, through pricing, through investment, through activist activity, that these firms are forced to keep some portion of their reserves in the ground, there will be an additional financial hit on those companies. Now, when that happens, yeah. 
Thank you. So whether that happens in the next few months, whether that happens in the long-term time frame of a pension fund, these companies are likely to continue to, uh, to underperform the broader market. So the two takeaways in terms of looking at the carbon underground, or we, there are three takeaways. First, when we look at it, we're looking at directly the carbon emissions that will need to be controlled. The second is that as a first step, every responsible investor, every organization, whether it's a, a state or city pension fund, whether it's an endowment or a foundation, that, for, that a first important step is to measure the carbon exposure of that entity. And the third message is that in terms of the investment consequences of carbon responsible investing and investment in particular, there's a strong case to be made that for organizations that do divest, their performance is likely to be in line with that of non-divested funds and most likely will over time outperform those funds. Thank you. Thank you.